Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains spooky. And today, we are going to discuss trains which is what we do a lot here. But this time, I decided to conduct a list of trains that, in their own ways, are kind of scary. Just, just a little bit. Just a little bit like, yo, chill out. We don't need this level of fear factor when we're looking at our trains. It doesn't have to happen. Now, the criteria, it took me actually most of the month to figure out exactly how it was going to do this. Because originally I thought, well, Scary, to me, is just more bad trains, but I have a whole list, a series of lists, about that already. And if I just made another list that was just all the scary ones, it'd be... Well, there were a lot of options, frankly. Um, so I decided to go mostly with appearances. Some of these have issues when it comes to operation, but for the most part, these are just trains that just... Yo, for one reason or another. These are five trains that just look kind of scary. The 87 series. Now, okay, I admit that this one, maybe to some of you, looks more cool than scary. But I mean, this does kind of look like the kind of train like a supervillain would uh, use, or some dude who runs around calling himself Darkness the Curse. Well, what, what do you want to fight? Like, it just looks really intimidating for Really no reason, because this is actually a pretty recent uh, creation built by Kawasaki Heavy Industries. It's a hybrid multiple unit, and it was built in 2016. Only one was ever constructed, at least so far, and it consists of 10 cars. It was put into service on the 17th of June, 2017, and it's still operating now under the name Twilight Express Mizukaze. This is a charter train. It's kind of built to be stylish and luxurious for people that can afford to ride on this train. Out of the 10 cars, set, six are actually sleeping cars. Five of those six each have three private suites, and the remaining car has a single luxury suite that occupies the entire car along with a bathtub and private balcony. There's also a lounge car, a dining car, and two end cars which act as the observation cars. It's really fancy, and for some reason, really, really dark. Like, it just looks to me, scary, just a little bit. Like, I stand by what I said. This is something a dude who was trying to take over the world would utilize. And, you know, whether or not you find it scary or not, it's certainly an interesting take. Organ Short Line, number 762. Ah! Okay, I see why that one's a little scary. But, uh, what's the deal with the blades? Well, Rail fans among you probably know exactly what this is already, but for those out of the loop and have never seen one before, this looks like nuts. Like, is that a wood chipper? Like, what is that for? It's just a weird old school way of getting rid of animals on the tracks by literally grounding them into a fine paste? No, no, not at all. That's not at all what this is for. Number 762 was used by the Oregon Short Line, constructed by Alco in 1912. This is a rotary snowplow, and a lot of different railroads use these. In fact, some still do on occasion. Basically, it works similar to a snow blower that you might have used in your driveway at some point. The rotary action chops through the snow on the rails and throws it to the side, out the top. It's actually a quite a novel idea, because some regions, depending on where you are, you may not understand how much snow some places get. There are places in the mountains where trains had to go that could get feet of snow, just like literally as tall as the trains themselves. That would happen, still does happen in some places. These were instrumental in keeping the lines clear so the trains could still pass, even in the heaviest of snowstorms. I chose number 762 because, well, I found the most information on it, frankly. It lasted a surprisingly long amount of time. It wasn't retired until 1971, and then it was moved to a restaurant at Blackfoot, Idaho for display. In 1980, the owners of the restaurant decided they didn't actually want the plow anymore, 
and they donated it to the Mid-Continent Railway Museum in North Freedom, Wisconsin. That's where she still is now, sitting on static display for anyone who wants to see her. Just don't get too close to those blades, because you might lose an arm. Oh, another minor note? This particular model, specifically number 762, was the basis for Dustin and Thomas and Friends. A lot of you might not be familiar with him, as I actually wasn't until I read about 762, because he was kind of late to the party when it comes to the series. Not dealing with any CGI nonsense, that was, wasn't happening. It wasn't the same, okay? It wasn't the same! You know it wasn't the same! But you know what a real horror story is? This. That's a real horror story. You want to- can we talk about that? Can we talk about that? Is this- is it- important to me to talk about. I, I do history here, but I'm about to do some history about this. That's what's gonna happen. And I'm not gonna be nice about it. Because, wow! The North Pacific Coast Railroad number 21. Oh dear. Yeah, now we're getting into some stuff. Just some, just some stuff. Some, yo, that, no, that, ugh, ugh, ugh. Number 21, uh, was a 440 American on the technical sense, but, um, well, for one thing, and I can't stress this enough, I said this before when I talked about it on Worst Trains Ever, because this did appear on Worst Trains Ever. This looks like somebody tried to make a steam locomotive in their garage. Actually, specifically a cab forward. It is notable as the first cab forward steam locomotive, and that's nice and all, but, um, yo, it... You just took a bunch of pieces and just, like, welded it all together. And I know that's how you make things, but in this case, you took completely unrelated pieces, it looks like. And you've created... You've created a monster. That's what you've done. Built in 1901 at the railroad's Sausalito shops, she was actually named Thomas Stetson. And they used her to haul redwood lumber, local dairy, and agricultural products, as well as express and passengers. But, well... For one thing, she was hideous, and I think that's obvious. Dr. Frankenstein would struggle to create a monstrosity of this magnitude, but she wasn't even good. Because, you know, whether or not a locomotive is ugly, you know, beauty's in the eye of the beholder and all that. If they do the work, they do the work. Number 21 didn't do the work, though. Not very well, anyway. Due to various design flaws, her adhesion weight was awful. And the oil burners were prone to damage because of how close they were to the water tubes. Yeah, she was an oil burner, which makes sense because of the cab forward design, but yeah, this technology was clearly in its infancy and did not work that well. Despite being named Thomas Stetson, she was actually referred to as the Freak by Cruz because of her ungainly appearance. She didn't last very long, only about four years, and was scrapped in 1905. Also, I didn't realize this until quite recently, but apparently the CGI era of Thomas was just full of let's just make characters out of everything, even when they don't make sense for the island of Sodor, or for how many engines the island should really logically have as a functioning railway. Because the character Lexi was based off of this horrid thing. And I kind of feel bad for Lexi. Like, I know everyone's always on Thomas for being an E2, but even the E2s lasted a lot longer than four years, and were good in some aspects. Number 21 was never good, which implies that Lexi is terrible, and she's only around because, I don't know, Sir Topham Hatt's a nice guy? Is he, though? I mean, earlier Sir Topham Hatt sealed Henry in a tunnel with bricks, like straight-up cask of Amontillado with no hesitation, and left him there for what I could assume to be a few weeks at least. Like, yo, old school Sir Topham Hat was hardcore, that man did not mess around. CIE's Pat. Pat? Is this called Pat? What is this? Is that just a car? No. No, that's a locomotive. That's a locomotive made out of scrap metal. CIE, as you know, is the Irish Railway, and they wound up owning, in the early 60s, a coal gantry in Cork that once belonged to the Great Southern and Western Railway. The Great Southern and Western Railway had left behind an interesting abomination that was lovingly referred to as Pat. Pat was the sole example of a locomotive that was made cheaply from literal scrap around 1905. He was put together by putting a vertical boiler 
on an old shunter's tender and attaching two cylinders ripped from a scrapped tank engine to the tender's axle, thus created Pat. He is literally built out of the pieces of scrapped locomotives. In the context of Thomas, where the trains are alive, let's put this into perspective, this engine was constructed out of the mutilated body parts of other locomotives. I don't know if we can get closer to Dr. Frankenstein's monster up in here with little old Pat. But to his credit, in his defense, first of all, he should not bear the burden of being what he is. He didn't choose to be born. But also, he lasted over 50 years, shunting around in that coal gantry. That's where he was all that time, and he continued to be used, like for being slapped together in the most literal way, at minimum cost, using the cheapest components available because they were literally being thrown out. 50 years of basically constant shunting duties? That's not bad. Yeah, he looks pretty ungainly, because he looks like what he's made of. But to Pat's credit, he did do good work. So does that make him scary? Well, maybe in context. This one grows weary of shunting coal. Pat, you, you, you okay up there, buddy? This one wishes to become a real steam engine. But, but Pat, you are real. You don't have to worry about what others say about you. You do good work. No. This one must consume the others. What? And only then will I become real. The Holman Horrors. Now, I recognize that I have talked about these before, much like number 21, but how could I put together a list of scariest trains ever and not include the ones that were literally called horror? And there are, well, very obvious reasons for why. Both of these creations, yes, there were two, were effectively just regular old 440 American locomotives, but they were mounted on, well, whatever those are, these weird roller sets, or extra wheels, wheels on wheels, if you will. It's like if you gave a locomotive roller skates, except why would you, they're already on wheels. It doesn't make any sense, and you may be wondering, what's the practical reason for this? There isn't one, that doesn't exist. There is no practical reason to ever do this. There's no reason to do it this way. Actually, when I talked about them before, someone tried to defend it by saying that, well, maybe they could use this method to change the gauge of a locomotive. Now, I am familiar with certain setups where they do do that, but that's not what these were. They did in no way alter the gauge, not at all. So given we know that they were originally 440s, what would they be now? I don't know. I am not doing the math on this. You can forget it. The first one of these was built by the Holman Locomotive Company in 1887 in Philadelphia. The second was built in 1897 for the Holman Locomotive Speeding Truck Company by Baldwin, believe it or not. And they were advertised as being able to go faster because of their extra wheels, because that's how that works. Oh wait, no. No, it's not. They'd be fortunate to be at the same speed, but only faster. There was no benefit to adding the extra wheels, except to perhaps make them a lot more top-heavy on corners and possibly tip over. Like, that could have happened, but that seems like what one would call a, a bad thing, not a, not a good thing. There's not an improvement. There's, in fact, a major deficit. Also, adding the issue of so many points at which the wheels could slip. But, in Holman's... <clears throat> Defense, not really defense, but maybe from a logical perspective. They didn't do this because they're dumb. They did it because they were trying to be clever and scammy. Because both locomotives were built, not because the Holman Company ever thought they were any good. It was a ploy to draw in ignorant investors who had no idea how trains really worked with something so eye-catching and ridiculous that it couldn't be ignored. The investors would then give the company the money, and the company would just, uh, vanish with the money, which seems to be the case for what happened here. There aren't that many records regarding exactly what happened after, or even how much money they really got away with. Both locomotives were eventually converted back into regular American locomotives and served for some time after that, because at their core, 
the locomotives are fine, the boiler, the cab, everything like that is okay. It's the ridiculous amount of wheels, the wheel gear setup thing that they got going on here, purely to scam people who had no idea how wheels or physics or anything involving a railway worked. They just wanted to invest their money to try to make more money, and instead, they got taken for a ride, and not because they took a ride on the train. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Sun Dude 267, Orange Glass, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hoth 444, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsu 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Master of None, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Alaric Jaspers, DM Tribal Typhoon, Tommy Rossini, Jack Carson's Railroad Videos, Ty Hammonds Jr., and Ohio Trucker 1. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.